if you and I, as members of the vine that is Jesus Christ, that is Yeshua, become fruitless, what does Jesus say will happen to you and to me? I think you'll find this teaching today very thought-provoking to you. I hope you do anyway, and it, but I think it will also encourage you and maybe even change your life. This is going to be a deep dive with additional thoughts I didn't get a chance to cover when I covered the previous sermon, which I hope you really watch, how to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, how to bear the fruit. Excuse me, I had to move away there just a second. So if you become fruitless, then what? Please watch and study the one I gave before this one, and then this one as well. And please have the printout of this sermon today open, so it will help you uh, follow along without me having to wait too long to go to s certain scriptures. And But please do put a marker at John 15. I think this teaching is going to give you a lot of food for thought. I think many of us have had times in our lives when we simply are fruitless, without fruit spiritually. John 15, verse 2, seems to say, if that happens, we are going to get cut off, taken off, removed if there's no fruit. Is that really what it says? And can that hang on? And can that uh, match the other teachings about our relationship with God once we have the Holy Spirit? So hang on. I think you're going to find this very thought-provoking. But maybe in your fruitless times, you were going through a super tough time in your life. And you just couldn't focus on much else. Maybe you're going through a divorce or you've been through, maybe you're put out of your church or you've just gone through something very emotional, maybe a series of deaths of loved ones in your family and you became fruitless. What is to become of us in our times of fruitlessness? Are we really going to be cut off and thrown out, thrown to the fires? That seems to imply what John 15, 2 says, certainly verse 6 says that. I want to compare John 15.2 and compare it with John 15.6. They are not saying the same thing. They are not saying the same thing. What does the original Greek have to say about these words? So listen carefully. You're going to be surprised, I think. We're going to study John 15.1-8 more deeply so it doesn't contradict other teachings of Scripture. I touched on John 15.2 the last time, but there's a deep theological issue at stake here that I have to address. I think what I'll show you is going to pleasantly surprise you. I covered last time how Yeshua loves finding fruit. Remember, he cursed a fig tree that didn't have any evidence of any fruit developing, even the not yet ripe ones that were, were available. That's in Matthew 21. I won't turn there, but Matthew 21, 18 and 19. And then he also gave a parable about how an unproductive fig was fig tree was being given one more year to see if they could prune it, clean it, fertilize it, dig around it to help it produce, help it produce more fruit. Luke 13, verses 6 to 9. I'll read that later on, too. It's absolutely true that Yeshua, Jesus, wants to see fruit on us. We are the branches that are supposed to be very closely tied in to him. So again, I'm Philip Shields. We, hey, by the way, I want to say this. We do appreciate you coming to our website, so please register as well. That allows you to leave comments and to ask questions. And it also helps our positioning on YouTube and other venues, and it really helps us somehow to get the word out more easily if you do register. We won't pester you. I promise that. We won't pester you at all. Let other, there are about five or six of you that I write little emails to that I'm very close to. But I mean, the many others who are registered on the site, uh, we, we won't pester you. So please sign up and let others know about the website. If you can find it, um, blesses you and helps you, then that this, that this website does, please let others know about it as well. Please do that. Anyway, I hope you'll watch the last video first. The fruit we bear, if you remember, is not our fruit. We're displaying the fruit of God's nature coming through us, his spirit in our lives, coming through us. The spirit is the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, not my fruit, not your fruit. And that's why it's called the fruit of the spirit. 
It's very important that we understand that. Part one goes into much more on that. The fruit of the Spirit is one fruit with nine components. It's one fruit. Just as one apple has at least six components, a stem, the skin, the flesh, the juice, the core, the seeds, and so on. In Scripture, the word fruit is singular. The fruit, not fruits, the fruit of the Spirit is, is what it says. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit are. So all nine components of this fruit show, will show up together. Kindness can't decide to have a day off when all the other components are working. They work together. They'll all show up. Someone full of love will not be unkind or have no joy. There are times that we don't remain connected to the Spirit, and even we will sometimes be unkind and so on, and that's not revealing the fruit of God's nature in us. Anyway, in the same way, the fruit of the vine comes from the vine producing fruit in due season. The branches, remember that's us, I'm the vine, you're the branches. The branches display the fruit and provide it to feed others so the deer come, the farmer comes, and they pick off the fruit. But we're going to read very clearly that the fruit comes from the vine. And if we're severed or not connected firmly to Christ, to the vine, we will not bear fruit. Now, God comes to live inside you and me by his spirit, and what we display and what our tree produces reveals what we are. We're, it reveals, supposed to reveal, that we are God's children. You don't have to be able to describe for me an apple tree. If I put you in, a, in an orchard that has apple trees and pear trees and everything else, grapes and cherries and so on, uh, and I say, show me which one is the apple tree, you may be lost unless it's a time when apples are appearing on the branches. Then it's very easy to say, that's a pear tree over there, and that one there is an apple tree. I know because I see the fruit of the apple. In the same way, people are supposed to see the fruit of God in me and in you when we display and hold up the fruit of God's nature, of his spirit. So that was all in part one and so much more than that. I started to cover John 15 as well, and the, the big thing about abide, the big key. But there's so much more to say, especially about verse 2 and 6, that I didn't cover really that well last time. So let's focus on that now. Keep your thumb or marker or something in John 15. I'm going to read first from the New King James, John 15, verses 1 to 4. I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. It sounds like it's cut off. But we'll talk about it. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. King James Version, purgeth, which actually has the implication of cleaning implied in it as well. Um, and you'll, we'll say more about that, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide, live, stick to, dwell in me. You must be in me. You must be in me and, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. That's what I was trying to say earlier. The fruit comes from the vine, not from the branch. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. All right. I want to focus now on verse 2. Remember what's most important are the actual words that Jesus or Yeshua said or used and not what our Bibles translate for us. We therefore have to know what the Greek here says. John fifteen two again. Every branch in me. I had somehow for years missed those two words. Every branch in me. Did you notice that before? He's talking about believers who are in him, in Christ. Ponder that. The only way you and I can be in him or in Christ is when we're immersed in him by baptism into his name 
and then an ordained elder lays hands on you asking for Father to send his Holy Spirit into you, which baptizes you through God's Spirit into God's Christ, one body. When I say an ordained minister, that's the examples I have. Uh, in Acts 8, Philip, who was a, a deacon, baptized a lot of people in Samaria, but he did not lay hands on them. It's very clearly told us that in Acts 8. So in Acts 8, verse 14, 15, 16, they send Peter and John down there, or up there, down there, I guess. And um, once they laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. Same thing in Acts 19, Paul, an ordained man, uh, laid hands on the people he had just baptized, who had not ever heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receiving the Holy Spirit in Christ and all of that. So you can see that for yourself. At baptisms, we're baptized into Yeshua, Acts 8, 16, Acts 19, verses 4 to 6, we're baptized into Yeshua. Now, it's vital that you see that these branches, he says, are in me. Don't miss that. And that's vital. There are other scriptures that show that when we're baptized, we're immersed, that's what baptized means, into Christ Jesus, Yeshua, our anointed one. I know some of you from various groups prefer, very much prefer, and only use the name Yeshua, never say Jesus. And then others of you much prefer Jesus, so please let me use both. Satisfy, I hope, none of you by <laughs> by doing that. But Yeshua was his Hebrew name, means Savior, saving one. And Jesus is the anglicized form of the Greek, Jesus. Anyway, Romans 6, 3, or do you not know? Romans 6, 3, you can follow along, or if you have printed out notes, which I hope you did. Do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So we're baptized into Christ Jesus. And I showed you already Acts 8, 16 and Acts 19, verses 4 to 6, where again they were baptized into Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. You're not baptized into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body. You're not baptized into the Father. I know Matthew 28, 19 is there, but every instance in the Bible of baptism, of what they actually said and did, every instance is that they baptized them into the name of Jesus. And there are people like historians, Eusebius, and uh, even uh, Clement of Alexandria, way back, who say that the original wording of Matthew 28, 19 was Jesus telling them to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into my name. And it makes sense when you look at all those other verses I just gave you that every single time they're being baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, 26, 27, for you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for you are already sons of God. Okay, it doesn't say uh, your fetuses. It says you're sons of God, children of God. So does 1 John 3, verse 1 and 2. Now are we children of God. We like to put a timeline that, if, no, we're still just developing as fetuses, or no, we won't be born again until... Uh, the Bible says once we're conceived of the Holy Spirit, we are children of God. We should quit really making an issue of that. Uh, genau, in the Greek, uh, can mean that whole period of time and does mean the whole period of time. Verse 27, Acts, uh, Galatians, I mean Galatians 3.27 for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Here's the theological issue now with saying that if we're not bearing fruit, that we are taken away or cut off or removed. Even if you're in Christ, in me, any branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, right? When God gives his Holy Spirit to you, he is committed to finishing what he started in you, the Holy Spirit begets you into the family of God. And as I said earlier, First John 3, verses 1 and 2, now are we children of God. But what happens when that Holy Spirit comes, it's like someone putting an engagement ring on someone he is proposing to. The engagement ring is the promise to marry that person. The Greek word for engagement ring is arabona. The Greek word for down payment 
is arabon, both meaning about the same thing, an intention to finish what you're starting. So in Ephesians 1, verses 13 to 14, in him you've also trusted. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. And if you haven't printed it out, I'll wait for you just a second or two each time if I can remember and let you find Ephesians 1. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, right? Okay. In him you also trusted, trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation. Yeah, the gospel includes the salvation story. Has to. In whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.13, I've just read. Now 14. Ephesians 1.14 who is the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. The guarantee of our inheritance. And we're sealed until the redemption of our purchased possession of the purchased possession. God purchased us. Christ purchased us with the cost of his blood. Okay, to the praise of his glory. So then I want to show you Philippians 1 6. Philippians 1 6. Just two more chapters later, I mean books later, Ephesians, no, one book later, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, right? Uh, being confident of this very thing, Philippians 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, when he returns, okay? He will complete it. It's a promise. And the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of down payment. It's the engagement ring of intentions to finish this. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, we just read that. And then Hebrews 10, 14, I've been talking about these verses a lot in the last few years that God, Christ, has perfected us by his one offering. For God sees the end from the beginning. So in his view, he's already perfected us, and he's com completely committed to seeing that that is what happens. So here's the dilemma. How can God take off the unfruitful branches that are in him, in me, it says, any branch in me, without contradicting all the guarantees I just read. If this branch is in Christ, he has received the Holy Spirit, he or she, okay? John 15, 2 again, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That's the part I'm talking about. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Now the words takes away, sounds like he cuts it off, he removes it, he hacks it off. Other translations have it as takes away, removes, cuts off, and so on. Almost every other translation does. Not, not everyone, but many do. <clears throat> Most do. Doesn't it sound like that anyway, but that, that it's cutting it off? Um, but here are the problems with that. It goes against the promised guarantee of the Holy Spirit. And it goes against Philippians 1, 6, that God is committed to finishing what he started in us. The Greek here for takes away is A-I-R-O, A-I-R-O, A-R-O, and is often translated as picks up or lifts up. In fact, my New King James Version has an asterisk beside the words takes away, and then you look up the asterisk down below, and it says it means, or it can mean, to lift up. The New English Translation says the same thing, that it can mean lifts up. <clears throat> Now, examples where this Greek word aero, A-I-R-O, number 141 in Strong's, is the same word that's translated as pick up or lift off or lift up in other places. John 8, verses 58 and 59. John 8, keep your fingers or something in John 15. We're going to hop back and forth to John 15 all day here. John 8, verses 58 to 59, And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I mean, he just used the name of Jehovah, the name of God there. And then they took up stones to throw at him. They took up stones, took up. 
The Greek there is aero. The aero stones. They took up. They lifted up. They picked up stones. That's the same word used there. You're not going to cut off stones. You're not going to remove stones. You're going to pick up stones. And that's what the arrow here means. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Took up. It's once again the same word as arrow. John 5, verses 8 and 9, the same word arrow is used here when he healed the man who complained that he couldn't get into the water fast enough to be healed. When an angel stirred it up, he said, Yeshua said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Take up your bed. Rise. It's from the Greek word aero. The same Greek word that says, Any branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he will aero. He will, translations say, remove, cut off. But the way that same word is used in many other places is pick up or take up. So he said to him, rise, aero, take up your bed and walk. Immediately the man was made well, aero, his bed, he took up his bed and walked. There are many more, uh, Mark 16, 18, uh, they shall, talking about his promises of, of having signs for his apostles, they shall take up serpents, you're going to cut them off, but you take them up, pick them up, and not be hurt. Aro, Mark 16, 18. The Greek for those and many more is Aro. There are also examples, however, where Aro is used in Scripture. To be fair, I want to show you both sides, because the, the translators weren't trying to be stupid. They just didn't understand the importance of having the branch that was in me. They missed that and the consequences of being in Christ. We have a guarantee now of it being finished in us. Are you getting that? Now, arrow, however, is also translated as move or remove, such as when Jesus said to move the stone at Lazarus's tomb, John 11:39. I suppose that could be translated to uh, pick up the stone, <laughs> but it's probably a pretty big stone, and so it's translated as move. Uh, the same word arrow, and examples of arrow being translated as take away could also be John 11:48. The Romans will take away our position, uh, the chief priests were saying about Yeshua, about Jesus. Um, I suppose it could be translated, they'll lift off or take up our, you know, but but it's it's taken, it's taken away. So apparently the word can be, depending on context, be used either way. But when you look at the doctrinal issue, I do not believe we are cut off or removed when we're fruitless if we are in Christ. If we are in me, as Christ said, when we look at the doctrinal issue here. If we become fruitless, are we really cut off or is he going to be committed to continuing to work with us if we're in him? Look what he did with Peter, for example. In spite of the three terrible denials of his, of, of his Messiah, we find that Yeshua, Jesus, restored him, worked with him, uh, inspired him tremendously, did not give up on him, did not cut him off. And that was a very fruitless activity, what he just did. No, I never knew this guy. So Christ works with me and you as well when we are fruitless. I believe that. I'm going to keep talking about that. He props us up. He lifts us up. He helps us become fruitful again. At least that's the Jesus I know. That's the Yeshua Jesus I love. Now let's look at the Passion Translation. I don't subscribe to all the ways that Passion transcribes or translates every verse in its New Testament. It, they only have it as a New Testament so far. And Psalms and Song of Solomon or Song of Songs and Proverbs. You can buy it that way, but you can also buy it as, a, as an audible. Not an audible, but as a, yeah, audio from uh, Olive Tree Group. <clears throat> John 15, verses 1 and 2 from the Passion Translation. 
I am the true sprouting vine. The father who tends, the farmer who tends the vine is my father. He, the father, cares for the branches connected to me. That's the in me part. The father cares for the branches connected to me by lifting up and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning or cleansing, as I'll show you, every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. Verse 2 again, he cares for the branches connected to me, the ones who are still there right in him, by lifting them up and propping them up. By lifting up and propping up the fruitless branches, pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. Sometimes some vine branches grow downward or fall downward and end up in the dirt where they're stepped on or can be stepped on in the dirt, need to be cleaned off. They're not getting enough sunlight and they become unfruitful when they're down like that. Sometimes we get down in the dumps. A lot of things are happening in our life. Like I said at the beginning, people are dying. We're sick. We have COVID. We have no energy. Or we lost our job or we lost our spouse. Well, we lost our parents. You know, I've had a lot of death in my family, including my own son and a, and a sister and a brother and another sister about ready to go, it seems. And my parents, many cousins, all my uncles and aunts. A brother has disappeared, an adopted brother. Many years ago, we've never been able to find him. So I've been through all of that. And in those times or times where you are in the dirt in the sense of playing around with sins you shouldn't be playing around with, or you've been kicked out and you just feel unfruitful and just feel like giving up, God comes along and says, wait a minute, I gave you my Holy Spirit and I'm, going, I'm committed to finishing what I started in you, Philip, and I'm not going to give up on you. So the gardener can prop them up or tie them up to a higher branch and get it all out of the dirt, clean it up, get more sun so it produces again. <clears throat> now, it's interesting that in verse 2 and 3, the same word, by the way, moving on from the word cuts off or whatever, takes off, that is translated prune, is also translated in verse 3 in most translations as cleansed or clean. But it's the same word. Now, not arrow this time, but the word for prune is the same word as some translations will say cleaned. If the Greek word translated is the same in verse 2 and 3, it amazes me why they changed the way they translated. <clears throat> in, in John uh, 15, verse 2, the branch that is producing fruit, he prunes. The, the Greek word there is kathero, K-A-T-H-A-I-R-O, K-A-T-H-A-I-R-O. R-O, Strong's word 2508, and a variant is 2513, where we get our word catharsis from. It was very cathartic. When we have to purge something out of our beings. That's why the King James Version that says, every branch that bears fruit, he purges, purges, kind of has a combination of cleaning and maybe pruning as well. <clears throat> but the Greek word there is kathairo or kathairo, and it means to clean, uh, or it, the Greek word is catharsis. So if you've been through a very emotional time in your life, a very emotional event, and now you're working with people and talking with people, and it's very emotional, uh, spewing out of things you've got to get off your heart. Uh, we might say later on that was a very cathartic moment. It was very cathartic for me. And that's the Greek word here. So I think... Uh, any of the translations that translate it as cleans, there are about five or six, I think have it correct. In verse 2, it's the same word as used in verse 3. It's funny how they'll use cleans in verse 3, but they say prunes in verse 2. So just be aware, this is going on in the Greek. Now let's continue in John 15, verse 4. And the key is to abide in him. Abide in me, and I in you. The branch, that's us, cannot bear fruit of itself. Cannot bear fruit of itself unless it sticks to, abides, lives in, dwells in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Now the word abide has to do with sticking with Yeshua, with Jesus, dwelling in him, 
making him your abode, to bear fruit as a vine, as a branch on the vine, we have to remain on the vine. Are you remaining on the vine day in and day out? Or do you go days without prayer? So as we seek our Lord, we can start to have an intimate, intimate relationship with Him. There is another kind of fruit that requires intimacy. It's called the fruit of the womb, a child, a baby. I mentioned that last time. I just want to make sure you got the aspect of this, though. That's one aspect. There will be no child. There will be no baby. There will be no fruit of the womb without very close, very intimate contact. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and then bore again Abel. Uh, Genesis 4, verse 3, I think it is. <clears throat> so what's involved prior to the baby being conceived is some lovemaking of the most intimate kind and abiding in Christ, whom we hope to marry as the bride of Christ, includes a very intimate way of looking at him. You love him and interacting with him in an intimate way. Okay, we aren't married yet, so I'm just saying, but there's a, just like an engaged girl looking at her fiancé, looks at him intimately. There's something in their eyes as they look at each other and as they are together. They want to be close together. That's what he says. Now look what the Passion Bible says in verse 4. I love this. So you must remain in life union with me. In, you must dwell in me. You can abide in me. You must remain in life union with me, for I remain in life union with you. As a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. I love that. Not just well in me, but intimately joined to mine, to my life. Folks, this is why the Song of Songs is all about, that's what it's all about. It's very explicit about the intimacy between two lovers. And let me say it, Yeshua, Jesus, my Lord, he's my Savior, he's my King. And I love him. And I tell him so. And I tell my Father that I love my Father in heaven. Have you used those words to God Almighty, your Creator, your Father? Father, I love you so much. And I love Jesus. I love Yeshua. We must be found to be abiding in Him, or as Paul says, be found in Him. In Him. Abiding in Him. We cannot be in Him, abiding in Him, and yet not be praying, seeking, communicating, interacting. Several times a day. Every day. No matter how busy I got when I was dating Carol, somehow... I found time to be with her, not just on the phone, not just by text. I mean, to be with her. Are you getting what I'm saying? We must be the same way if we're abiding in Jesus Christ. Of all the things Paul could say about his own accomplishments, by the way, his own background, his own credentials, and they were impressive. Well, let's read what he says. Because this has to do with being in Christ. Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Be turning there now. Verses 3 to 11. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. We worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. Have no confidence in the flesh. This is New King James I'm reading. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Hey, look, I was circumcised the eighth day. Everything was done right. Of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee. And the Pharisees are the um, four, forefathers, the ancestors of the modern Orthodox Jews that we see today. And so if you think of the Orthodox Jews, that's what Paul was. I was an Orthodox Jew, a Pharisee, which, by the way, means separated one, separated from the others. I'm not like these others. I'm not going to eat with them. I'm not going to have them as my friends. I'm separated from them. I'm a Pharisee. So concerning the law of Pharisee, <coughs> and that said all he needed to say. 
concerning the law, you know I was strict. Concerning zeal, hey, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things, I'm in verse 7 now, Philippians 3, verse 7. What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Indeed, I counted all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. King James says dung. The Greek word is skubalon, skubalon, um, which can include the, the meaning as refuse, garbage, even dung, animal excrement. It can include all of that, that which we throw to the dogs or the, uh, the, the, the parts of animal carcasses that we throw out, things like that. And so then he goes on. He says, all these things I've done, I count as a bunch of dung, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I don't care about anything else in my life except being found in Yeshua, that I may be found in my Messiah. Verse 9, Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, from the Torah. I don't want my own righteousness from Torah. I don't want that. But many of you seem to want that. But that which is through faith in Christ, in Messiah, the righteousness which is from God, by faith, that's what I want, to be in Him and receive God's own righteousness given to me by faith in Him. Verse 10, that I may know Him, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being con conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I want the resurrected Christ living in me. I want the righteousness of God himself imputed, credited, given to me. As so many verses say, we'll read shortly here. And that I've talked about so many times, and yet there's still so many Church of God people and Hebrew Roots people who will reject this. They think we've got to come up with our own righteousness. Paul says, I don't want my own righteousness from keeping Torah. I don't want it. I want God's righteousness by faith. So that's my goal now, too, to know Jesus Christ as my Savior, the Anointed One, as my own life, my own being. How we still fall short. But the closer we are to him, in him, knowing him, the more fruit of the Spirit we will have. So I want to get to know him. Just a note here, by the way, the Holy Spirit. It's called different places in the New Testament as the Spirit of God the Father. In fact, Jesus says in Acts 1, verse 4, 5, somewhere in there, that stay here in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. Okay, the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father. But it's also considered the, the, the Spirit of Christ. You can't read Romans 8, 9 without seeing that. It's called the Spirit of the Father and of Christ. So it's both, God the Father and Christ's Spirit. It's one and the same Spirit, okay? There's one Spirit. In fact, in 1 Peter 1, 11, 1 Peter 1, 11, I'm not going to read it. I'll, turn, I'll tell you about it. It says the Spirit of Christ was what was inspiring the prophets of old. Anyway, so give up your own accomplishments, your own pride in what you've accomplished and done, and now start looking to be in him and what he can accomplish in you uh, and, and display through the Holy Spirit in you. Now, how is John 15, 2 different from John 15, 6? I often get that question. At first blush, they seem the same, talking about an unfruitful branch of the vine being cut off and thrown away. I've already shown you that to make the theology work that God will not leave us or forsake us never 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 Romans 8 the end of it says all that he'll never leave us nor forsake us Hebrew says that as well to make the theology work it has to be lifted up and cleaned up he doesn't just whack us off and forget John 15 2 is about a vine that's in me that branch is not separated from Christ but is in him Still, but just not that involved, not producing fruit at that moment. The verse 6 kind of branch is not said ever to be in Christ, but is said to be separated from the vine. It's already gone. 
be sure you see that difference. Maybe that intimate, close relationship was never there with the verse 6 branch. If a branch of the vine lets itself get torn off, or if we purposely separate ourselves from Christ permanently and the Holy Spirit permanently, then there remains only a fearful looking towards the punishment, fearful judgment of fire, as Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 both tell us. But here are a few more verses from the Passion Translation. So you see the difference between the verse 2 branch, which is in me, and lifted up, and the verse 6 branch, that's already separated. It's not in him at all. Now, Passion Bible, well, let's read verse 5 and 6. I am the sprouting vine, and you are my branches, as you live in union with me as your source. Fruitfulness will stream from within you. You know, it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bears its fruit in its season. Psalm 1, right? Just came to me as I'm looking at this here. Fruitfulness will stream from within you. And when you live separated from me, you are powerless. Verse 6 from the Passion Translation. If a person is separated from me, he is discarded. It's already there on the ground, discarded, already cut off. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire to be burned. So notice in verse 6, the person is no longer in Christ or in me and is not abiding in Christ, has become separated from Christ. This branch in verse 6 is entirely different from the description of John 15, 2, where it talks about the branch being in me, not bearing fruit. But it doesn't get, in my opinion, with the Greek aero and everything, not it does not get cut off, but it's propped up, cleaned off. It's been in the mud a while, in the dirt a while. God doesn't like us in the dirt. And so the word prune and, and clean can both come from the same Greek word, kathero or something like that in the Greek. Several translations, like the American Standard Version, the Good News Version, the American Contemporary Version and Fred Coulter's Bible and Young's Literal Version combines the both concepts of purges and cleans and, and, and John 15 too. John's, Young's Literal says he doth, he doth cleanse by pruning it. I think it has more to do with cleaning than it does pruning. But there are times to prune branches back. I know if I have... Uh, flowering bushes out here that aren't flowering so good if I pruned them all back. And uh, someone might come and say, why did you cut it down so much? And it comes back more powerful, bushier, more flowers than ever before. Anyway, now verse 3, you're already clean. The word clean, again, I want to say that is the same word as prune. Why they use prune for one verse in verse 2, then change it to clean in verse 3, same word in the Greek, I don't know. But my point is this. Our Savior is noticing what your state is. He is Savior. He is Savior. He is going to save you. He's not going to sit by, give up on you. Not very easily. He's just not. You know, well, you might, might not know, but 27 to 30 years ago, there were some very willing to throw me out, give up on me. My Savior did not give up on me but stayed with me and kept working with me. So I continued to abide in him, even though men's organizations said, get out, we don't want you anymore. For various reasons, whatever. God did not give up on me. If you're separated from the vine, and I say that, I hope, as encouragement to some of you, Maybe you went into a period of uh, various sins, maybe alcoholic sins or sexual sins or all the above. And you know at one time you were baptized and received the Holy Spirit. Ask him to prop you up, clean you up, and get back to working with you. If you've separated from the vine, there's no chance at all of having any fruit. So don't stay out there separated. We've learned that in verse 4, that if we're not abiding in Christ, there's no way we can bear any fruit. We have to abide in Christ. So if you're not bearing fruit, streaming from within you, fix the problem. Return to Yeshua. Return to Father in heaven. 
and begged them, begged God for forgiveness, and asked to be made into a branch that is in him again, abiding in him. We're told God does not give us, does not give up on us so easily. He gives us time. He is patient with us. Keep your finger there in John 15. We're going to come back to it one more time. I'm going to look at other verses now. There are times we become less fruitful. I have and you have. And there are times we're totally unfruitful when we take our gaze off our leader. But there's another story of how his desire is to turn us around and make us fruitful. We do have to respond to his calling, though, his voices within us, his strong urges uh, that we feel. Yeshua, Jesus, gave a parable of a fig tree that had borne no fruit for three years. Let's read it in Luke 13, verses 6 to 9. Luke 13, verses 6 to 9. Initially, his first thought was to just get rid of it, get rid of the whole tree. But in this case, it's not about being a branch on him in this story or it's about a fig tree. It's about a whole tree that's not bearing fruit at all. And look what the gardener, what God does. Okay? Luke 13, verses 6 to 9. Got to make a note here, Zai. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. So he's got a bunch of vines and a fig tree in there, he says. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. He said to the keeper of the vineyard, remember the other parable or, or story, he said, God is the vine dresser. Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Just cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to the man who owned the, the, the land, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down, if that's what you want. But but um, my point in the story, by telling this account, this parable, is that God will dig around you, fertilize you, prune you, do what weed around you, do whatever is necessary to get you producing fruit again. He's a real good, he's real good at producing fruit in us when he's working with us. So if you want more fruit and see very little fruit of God, of God's Spirit in your life, ask Him. Ask Him to produce it in you. Ask Father the gardener to work with you in His mercy, fertilizing, watering, digging around, feeding, weeding, all of those things, and to have mercy on you, and He will. Notice the wording in this translation on verse 5, going back to John 15, 5, in the Passion Bible, John 15, 5 again. Fruitfulness will stream from within you. If you seek God diligently with all, their, all your heart, if we do, with all our hearts, He will bless us and He will reward us. Hebrews 11.6 Those who diligently seek Him, He will reward. He will cover us with His own righteousness. Philippians 1.11 tells us that, that He wants us to be filled with the fruit of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Be filled, Philippians 1.11, with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Now, this isn't talking about fruit of the Spirit, but the fruits, plural, of righteousness. Other scriptures that show it is Jesus Christ who produces the fruit, Romans 5.17 says, actually, the righteousness of God is his gift to us. Romans 5.17 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we, 2 Corinthians 5.21, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. I've spoken many times about Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11, and other places. Um, and then finally, I want to end with John 15, verse 8. Again, this one from the Passion Bible. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you will demonstrate you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. You want to prove to anybody that you're a disciple of God? Bear the fruit, and it will happen. You, they, will, they will know who you are. No, they might want to kill you for that. <laughs> That's just the way it goes, isn't it? 
The key to growth and fruit is to abide in him, in Christ. The more we abide in him, the more fruit we will have. It's not abiding in a prophecy time chart or time flow charts that you have. It's not abiding more and more technical Bible study, Greek and Hebrew. All of that is meaningless if we're not having time in prayer and seeking him with all our heart, talking to him many times in a day and listening to him as we pray. I like to pray with a pad of paper and I'll say some things for five or six minutes and then I'll stop. And I'll say, Father, please talk to me. Yeshua, Jesus, please talk to me. What do you want me to hear from you? And I just listen. Sometimes nothing comes. Sometimes I can't start, I can't start writing fast enough. Many times nothing happens, but sometimes days later, God answers that prayer and starts to tell me things, strong urges that I need to do this or do that. And as we obey those strong urges, as long as they're not urges to do any sin, but if they're strong urges to do this or do that or go here or go there or get off the freeway now, or, and boy, I've had that strongly a few times. God's helped me avoid accidents that happened just in front of me. Anyway, obeying his commands that come with strong feelings, you'll get more and more of them. If you don't listen to those strong feelings, you'll get less and less. It's about being intimately close to our Savior, like the feeling you get reading David's Psalms. So again, if you're in Christ, no longer bearing fruit, I believe with all my being that he's going to come around, prop you up, lift you up, clean you off, and get you being productive again, especially if you're seeking for that. Okay, thank you. I hope that was helpful. And please leave comments if you can on the sermon. And uh, certainly in the blogs, I know it's easy to leave comments. But anyway, thank you very much. And uh, until next time, this is Philip Shields. God be with you and walk with you. You walk with him. You'll never walk alone if you walk holding his hand as you go. Bye-bye for now. Remember to uh, mark this as a like or make some kind of comment or register. It really helps our standing in the in the various venues. Thank you so much.